Hey everyone, my name is Eric, and I want to tell you about my new podcast, Stay Away From Matthew McGill. Five years ago, a friend told me about this strange guy. He was an old man living alone in the woods on the Georgia-Florida border. You see people sleeping out in a while. He didn't mind doing that. I heard he, he was from Australia. Did you ever I, hear that? I think I did. And everybody, everybody had a story about who this guy was. He told me he got selected as an escort for Miss America, Formula One racing. He had his own car. He also married an actress, a Broadway actress. But, turns out, this guy had a lot of secrets. The warrant was served and executed in a 10-man armed raid at our home. You learn to recognize people who have a little bit of con in them, and he was that. Stay away from Matthew Miguel. New episodes everywhere weekly, or you can binge the whole thing right now exclusively on the new Odyssey app. That's A-U-D-A-C-Y. Thanks. Hey, I know we've done a little warning before every episode, but just a heads up, this week's story delves deeper into a specific account of sexual violence. If that's something that's upsetting to you, please take care while you're listening. Thank you. How are you? Uh, I'm good to be right. Nice to see you. The audio you're hearing has never been made public before. Is it right? Perfect. Oh, okay. If you listen to episode three of this podcast, you know about the model Ombra Gutierrez. You know about the police sting operation she participated in. And you know about the two minutes of audio she helped me release of Harvey Weinstein admitting he'd grabbed her breasts and saying, I'm used to that. His regular coffee needs and is very perfect, perfect. small. <laughs> but the recordings Ombra made, they're actually more than 25 minutes long. And the parts you haven't heard, the parts before and after that apparent confession, reveal a lot about Weinstein and the tactics he's been accused of using across decades of alleged misconduct. This week, Ambra agreed to let us broadcast those parts for the first time. So I'm glad you went because, you know, I made this a movie many years ago with Johnny Depp and Kate Winslet. Yes. And now I, I wanted to make it a musical and make it emotional. There's a lot going on in this full recording. It's March 2015. Ambra and Weinstein are sitting at the bar of the Tribeca Grand Hotel. She's just seen the Broadway show Finding Neverland, which Weinstein produced and got her tickets to see. I'm glad you saw Now you see my work. Yeah, it was beautiful. You know, you can see really beautiful. Too, you know? It's important to remember that the NYPD is undercover in the room with them. Everything Ambra says is to keep Weinstein talking. They talk about the films he's worked on, like Cinema Paradiso. And I love them. Like, Paradiso, Cinema Paradiso is one of my favorite. But then, after only a minute and eight seconds, the tone shifts. So I will tell you something that I think you could be good for, but we're going to have to teach you a little bit. Yeah. And Weinstein appears to dangle the promise of career opportunities. I'm doing a, a, a TV series with Giuseppe Tornatore, the director of Cinema Paradiso, and it's really? called Omerta. In exchange for a more intimate relationship. So maybe when you go back, you go and audition for this, but you need to have an acting coach. Yeah, yeah, I know. I need to, I know. if you want to spend time with me, whatever, I, me I will mentor teach. you, I teach you, oh. whatever, but you have to, you know, relax with me, have fun, enjoy. Uh, you know? I mean, uh, it's kind of like, yesterday I was kind of like that because I'm not feeling very good. Like, uh, Umbra hedges, like, saying she hasn't been feeling well. It's a version of Weinstein so many women have told the story of, but we've almost never gotten to hear, how his comments about professional qualities turn increasingly personal. But I think you have a great curiosity, and I think you're very cool, and, and I'm cool with you, and whatever, it's nice. And I'm not in the way of your boyfriend, no, I or, think, no, you know, I mean, you have boyfriends, very, very do what amazing, you want, you know, yeah, do, you know, amazing, know. Like, As Umbra keeps trying to turn the conversation toward the previous day, when she says he grabbed her, Weinstein keeps returning to her career aspirations, including an upcoming audition with Victoria's Secret. You know, I don't get paranoid. You know, everything no. is good. You have, beautiful no. body. you have a beautiful body. Yeah, but, you know, my, I have a paranoid about my boobs because, yeah, if they, you know. I'll look at them, whatever, and I'm sure they're beautiful because they're beautiful in the picture. Uh, I mean, whatever. But, you, but uh, they feel like the real art. They, you know, I can tell. I mean, really? But I don't know uh, if everybody can tell. Yeah, because you know, yesterday it was kind of a hard thing, like. Don't worry about it. Stop. It's beautiful. Don't don't get your head crazy. Think positive. You're more beautiful than Adriana Lima. No, it's not. Okay, it's true. No, she's amazing. No, you're amazing. Hang on, I'm just about. Okay. This is the Catch and Kill podcast. I'm Ronan Farrow. As Harvey Weinstein faces criminal charges in New York and Los Angeles, Weinstein is continuing to deny all allegations of non-consensual sex. And prosecutors are trying to establish patterns in his behavior. Harvey Weinstein's sexual assault trial in New York now has a jury. This is the most high-profile case, and I will say, one of the most important cases we've seen in the century. In New York, he's been charged with sex crimes, including rape, based on the claims of two women. But prosecutors are also calling at least four other witnesses to try to establish a pattern of predatory sexual behavior. Authorities in Los Angeles have contacted witnesses who might serve a similar purpose. Across the more than 80 claims of sexual misconduct that have been publicly raised about Weinstein, one of the most obvious patterns is just how many of these stories begin with the promise of a professional opportunity. How Weinstein used his power to make careers and lashed out with his ability to break them. Today, we have three women who encountered that pattern over the course of 20 years. 20 years of promises that turned into traps. In the early 90s, the actor Rosanna Arquette. Because I'm an actor, I have a sense memory thing, so I'm actually feeling anxious, heart racing, retelling it to you right now. 
then in the early 2000s, a college student on summer break, Lucia Evans. Okay, let's just look at the facts here. He's a producer. He wants me to come in to talk about these scripts. And it's during the day. On paper, it's, it's okay, right? It's a very rational thing to ask somebody. And finally, in 2014, a recent law school graduate who took a week-long temp job at the Weinstein Company's front desk, Emily Nestor. So often, women, I think, have to walk this line between being desirable and being taken seriously. You almost expect that it's a, an element of everything you do, that you're going to have to fend this kind of advance off. Their stories, along with that new tape, shed light on Weinstein, on the trial, and on the wider phenomenon of wealthy and connected people abusing their power. We could do no headphones because I'm right here and I can hear your questions. Are we just doing this because we, we like the sound of our voices? What are we doing? I like, I like it. Okay. Okay. Rosanna Arquette's breakout role was opposite Madonna in the 1985 hit okay. Desperately Seeking Susan. But she has an even longer history in the industry. Her father acted, her siblings act, so she knows Hollywood. I have a great story for you. Please. One of Rosanna's first auditions came in the early 80s for a film called SOB, directed by Blake Edwards. Blake Edwards, who directed Breakfast at Tiffany's. Blake Edwards, wow. And it was William Holden, Robert Preston, Julie Andrews, an extraordinary cast of incredible actors. I got the part, probably because I had big boobs, <laughs> which I didn't think about at the time. Ironically enough, the film was a satire of the oversexualized nature of Hollywood. Arquette showed up on set one day to film, and she says she was handed a scene that wasn't in her original script, a scene where her character had this pretty specific problem. I had sunburned boobs, and I walk in, and I say, what do I do as sunburns? And he goes, ice. And then you see a scene of me putting my boobs in a freezer, like standing in the freezer like I'm a dumb, big, titted girl. So I get on the set, and it's Blake Edwards, and I'm really nervous, and, and he says, yeah, yeah, you know what? Bikini top doesn't work. Just lose a bikini top. Okay, everybody, action. Oh, well, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Edwards, you mean take off my bikini top? You take it off? And my breasts and he goes yeah you have a problem with that and I said I didn't know I was going to be naked and he goes ah oh, Tony come on is this partner call her agent and I I was so flipped out and I did it wow how old were you I mean I was young now it's not in the movie it was cut thank god when I told my mother she flipped she goes do you know what that was that was so wrong to do to you and she knew and she said that to me and I you know you didn't you don't know like you're I didn't know I'm allowed to say no So my situation that happened at the Beverly Hills Hotel in the early 90s was there was a film called Romeo's Bleeding with Gary Oldman, and he had wanted me to play the wife. He being Harvey Weinstein. Arquette says her agent set up the meeting between her and Weinstein, thinking Weinstein's company Miramax might wind up producing the film. So I go to the Beverly Hills Hotel. I get We're supposed to have dinner. Had you met him before? We'd met. We'd met, but I, like on a festival thing. Got Hi, it. I want to work with you. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. So you'd time. met him briefly. Briefly. Did you know anything Publicly. About nothing. No sense of he had a reputation. Heard, no, for... just that he's gruff. He's a gruff man. He's a, he's a powerful guy. But, but he was always like kind of a gentle giant. You know, always the first time I met him, he's like he was a sweet. He seemed nice. So I get there, supposed to have dinner at the polo lounge, and Mr. Weinstein will see you upstairs. And I got really like ew. I did have that moment, right? And and I said okay, but it's not a big deal. I met a lot, a lot of directors in hotel rooms. I did for years. That's where people held meetings. If you're coming from New York, you rent a hotel and you have a suite and the living room part is where the meeting is. It's not in a bed. There's no bed there. And I get up there, he opens the door in his white bathrobe, which was this thing. I was on, I can't move my neck. I cannot move my neck. And I was like, I, I stood back and I went, oh, I have a masseuse for you. For you. And he took my hand and he, he, he pulled your hand towards, towards his penis. Like he, I had to pull my hand away. It was gross. Rosanna started to leave. He said, Rosanna, you're making a very big mistake. She says he name-dropped two famous women, implying he'd helped their careers in exchange for sexual favors. And I said, I'll never be that girl. And I left, went down the elevator, and then that's it. What were you thinking as you left that meeting with Harvey? Oh, I knew. As soon as I went down that elevator. It was just like, I, I knew it. It's over. Like I got to the bottom floor, and I just immediately knew. I said, there's going to be retaliation. I'm fucked. I, I know it. Mm. And I, I was right. Harvey dangles things in front of you as an actress, you know, roles and, oh, you might be good for this. In 2004, about a decade after Rosanna Arquette's encounter with Weinstein, Lucia Evans met the producer. It's almost like the way I, I dangle a treat in front of my dog and try to get them to come closer to me or to sit or to do a trick or something. She had just finished her junior year of college. She was staying in New York for a summer design internship, and in her spare time, she was taking acting lessons near Times Square. She'd always wanted to be an actor. In a lot of ways, this made Lucia vulnerable to Weinstein's pattern of promises. She was young. A foot in the door would mean a lot. But also, she had heard stories about Harvey Weinstein. Coincidentally, a family friend named Peter Biskind had written a book about Miramax, an independent film. 
I had heard Peter, when he came over to my parents' house for dinner, say, you know, don't trust Harvey. Harvey's terrible. You know, Harvey did this. Harvey did that. He even said some of the things that have come out in your articles. Some of the women, he named them. So in some ways, you knew more going in than a lot of sources I've talked to. Yes, I knew a lot going in. I knew not to trust him, but he's also the most powerful person in Hollywood, right? One night that summer, Lucia was out with a friend at a club called Cipriani Upstairs. That's where they saw Weinstein. She says she made eye contact with him, and he approached her. He walked over to me, and um, and that's when the trouble began. Lucia says they talked for a bit. He sat down next to her, and despite having heard the rumors about him, she told Weinstein she wanted to be an actor. There's this part of you that says, well, this is maybe this is my big break. That's always the part. And that part in the past is usually one with, one with me and it one with others. I believe we exchanged numbers at that point, and, and he said... I'll get you um, a meeting with our casting director in our office, and there's some scripts that you might be great for and that you will you can read for. Over the following nights, Weinstein called Lucia, often very late. He would call me at like at 1 or 2 in the morning, and then he tried to invite me somewhere, and I was like, no. Like, I, you told me I could come to your office and and talk about these scripts, so that's what we're going to do. You know, and, and I, I felt so powerful saying that to him, saying, like, no, absolutely not. Like, we're going to do it like you had told me when I met you. Eventually, Weinstein's people did set up a meeting. It was in the afternoon at his office in Tribeca. It was a warm summer day. Lucia walked there from where she was living. She was told she'd be meeting with Weinstein and then with his casting director, a woman. And walking there, I felt I felt pretty good. I was like, I was nervous, of course, but I was also like, cautiously optimistic. It's not even like it sounded too good to be true because I'm not an idiot. I mean, if he was like, I'm going to cast you in the next something, I mean, I would have been like, that's kind of bullshit. It seemed realistic instinct. to you. It you seemed realistic. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is like, okay, I mean, I'm going to look at some scripts or talk to the casting director. This is a good first step. It seems like this is what should happen. Everything was designed in a very careful way to make me feel a little bit safer. Hello, Lucia. Hi, Ronan. Yeah. Hi, how are Hi. you? Hi. Good. How's it going? This is the tape from the first time I ever spoke with Lucia back in 2017 when I was reporting the story for The New Yorker. It's going, uh, you know, I was about to say it's going great, but I guess it's going very strangely. Right? <laughs> it's so odd, isn't it? Um, One of the hardest parts of my job is asking people to recount in painful detail the worst moments of their lives. Lucia has done that a number of times now, and it's never easy. So rather than have her do it again in the studio, we agreed I could play you this recording. My parents don't know anything happened. Like, I still don't know, and I'm very close to them. On the call, she told me about the walk to the meeting, about how when she arrived, there were other people around. But when she went into Weinstein's office, it was just the two of them. Just a warning, the next few minutes of this are graphic. And I was like, oh, crap, like, oh, crap, right? Mm. Like, but still, there's so many people outside. Like, um, So long story short, um, he forced me to have oral sex with him. And, um, and, and I'll... I'm so sorry, Lucia. <laughs> it's okay. Lucia says when she first walked in, he pulled out two scripts to discuss, a horror film and a teen romance. Like, it's probably like, this is the ploy he does with like all these women. He told her she'd be great on Project Runway, which he was producing, but she'd need to lose a little weight. That's when, she says, he forced her to perform oral sex on him. I mean, did he ask yeah. you, was there a preamble to this? Did he ask you? We're no, 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 he literally just took his dick out of his pants. He just Without took it out of saying his anything pants. beforehand? There was no, no flirtation just, beforehand? No, 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 no. He just literally took his dick out of his pants and got himself hard and then grabbed my head and stuck it down on it. And, 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 and well, and, and in grabbing my head, I, I, like, at that point, I'm sure I was like, no, I, I said, no, stop, I don't, I don't want to do this. It was a forcible encounter. Um, and then I, and then I did, str I tried to struggle away. Um, I remember just trying to, like, get up and struggle away, but he's a big guy, you know? So he, he just, he, he overpowered me. I think I just sort of gave up. And, and that's where I feel like if it, if it had been, like, a, um, like, oh, no, he, like, a thousand percent forced me, and I was, like, screaming and, like, fighting him to the death. I would feel, like, a little more proud, right, of this whole situation. But I think I just gave up and just said, I'm just going to do this. Like, this is currently what I have to do. But, um, and that's the most horrible part of it, and that's why he's been able to do this for so long. There's so many women just said people just give up, and then they feel like it's their fault. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, because if it had been all, like, clear-cut things, I mean, I feel like a lot of people, like, would be coming forward earlier, but... It's never clear cut, but power is a very real thing, and it's and and it's intimidation is very real, and that's what he did, you know. So. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> I was just hoping that it wasn't going to be me. I was like, please, let it, like, whatever happens, just like, let it not be me. And I, my life had been very magically good. I had a wonderful childhood, and. You know, I, I was very lucky, very, very lucky. So I almost couldn't conceive of it happening. I think people sometimes don't, you just cannot imagine something like this happening to them. And then it does. And then come out the other side and then have to reconcile that with your life before and, and realize that your life is completely different.
This alleged behavior of Weinstein's, it wasn't just with aspiring actresses. So you're thinking, okay, well, clearly there's a little interest here that's not professional, but maybe it's not like that. Maybe he really does want to get to know me. In 2014, 10 years after Lucia Evans' alleged assault, Emily Nestor had just finished law school and was working on her MBA. Maybe he heard that I have a law degree and an MBA. Maybe he thinks, oh, this is a smart gal. I want to get to know who's at my front desk. She was thinking about getting into entertainment law, maybe producing, when she got an offer from an acquaintance for a temp gig, four or five days working the front desk at the Weinstein Company's L.A. office. Her first day felt weird almost immediately. I had a few people say, you're his physical type. You should watch. He's going to try to scoop you for an assistant or something. What did you make of people saying to you from square one, oh, you're his type? It didn't raise a ton of red flags for me. L.A.'s a bizarre bubble, and it didn't seem unusual for a man of his stature to want to be surrounded by tall, pretty, blonde women. It's super common. Because that is so often the case. It's so L.A. Like, it happens all the time. It's like the whole, like, Leonardo DiCaprio thing. They walk in with, like, a group of them. Emily says Weinstein arrived at the office around mid-morning. Over the course of the day, she had a couple of strange encounters with him. She says he saw her and asked her how old she was. At one point, he referred to her as the pretty girl. And I remember thinking, kind of like, ooh, that's, that's weird. It was all a little off, especially for a first day of a temp gig. And as the day was wrapping up, it got even more complicated. Weinstein and his assistants were on their way out of the office. But when they got to the elevator, he stopped. So he sent his, ele- his, his assistants down the elevator and said, I'll catch up with you later. And he walks up to the front desk where I am. And I start, you know, like a normal person, you know, doing small talk as you would with the CEO of a company. And he rips off part of the sign-in sheet for guests. And he says, write down your number. He asked her to get drinks with him that evening. So I quickly made up an excuse. I have a late dinner with friends. Uh, he said, no, you don't. You're having drinks with me. And I said, I don't think so. I've already, I've already got plans, you know. He said, OK, well, you know, I'll message you later. And then left. Later that night, Weinstein texted Emily, trying again to get her to meet for drinks. And I'm thinking, OK, well, I really do want a job in entertainment. And it's all about connections. I'll ask him for an early morning coffee before work. And work started, I think, at 8. So it was early, thinking there's no way he would agree to it. And that even if he did, it would send a very clear message that this is a professional meeting. It's for coffee before work. And to my surprise and chagrin, he agreed. So you have this dilemma. You have warning sirens going off. Right. And you're headed into breakfast with him. And I'm dreading it. I I wear these kind of loose satin pants that I had um, that were kind of baggy, but, you know, dressed up for work. Uh, And then this sweat, this like kind of rose colored sweater that also was kind of baggy. And I wore my glasses on purpose um, because, you know, they're dorky. Emily met Weinstein in the lobby of the Peninsula Hotel, about a mile and a half from the hotel where Rosanna Arquette met him two decades before. They went to the upstairs restaurant. Emily ordered an iced coffee. She tried to talk about her credentials, but Weinstein didn't seem interested. He asked if I had a boyfriend, and I said yes. I made one up. I didn't have one at the time. And he seemed undeterred by that. He said, oh, a lot of the girls I, you know, have been with have have boyfriends. And and again, I'm talking about my credentials, and he starts saying, oh, I know this uh, great attorney, and, you know, I could set you up with her. You could talk to her about her career path. And later it turned into... You could be my girlfriend. You could be my assistant in London and be my girlfriend there. In one sentence, he covered all the grounds for sexual harassment. I mean, literally offering a benefit in your career for sexual favors. In one sentence. It wasn't even subtle. Weinstein kept pressing. Asking me to take my glasses off so that he could see my face better. uh, Asking to hold my hand. I mean, I feel like a fortunate one after reading a lot of the women's experiences that he asked. But I said no. He even seemed to be aware of what was happening of how much of a pattern this was. Even, you know, kind of jokingly talking about how most women say no to begin with, and after a couple beers, then they're all over him. At one point, he said something about Bill Cosby and how he'd never had to do anything like him, which I understood to mean he'd never had to drug anyone to get them to sleep with him. Again, I've also got the lawyer brain on that's like, how stupid are you to be saying these? I mean, these things are so incriminating. And what's going through your mind as all this is playing out? Get out. Just just get through this. Just get through this. Just get through this. When is this going to end? Just get through this. I mean, it was the longest hour of my life. Something that really haunted me later was thinking about how many women he must meet and, and how many you know starving actresses and models that I've met in L.A. or New York and, and, and how desperate they are for work. And they're clinging to these dreams that are like one in a million dreams. What if this was my one shot? I mean, how different and how vulnerable would I have been? How did the breakfast end? (laughs) Um, (laughs) He was going to go to his room and he saw me to the elevator and he said, I'll just shake your hand. I don't want to get sued for sexual harassment. After the break, from promises to punishment. Welcome back. 
one of the things that so many women talk about in their encounters with Harvey Weinstein is how he would offer roles or jobs or mentorship. But the women also talk about how those carrots came with sticks. Come on, I'm going to go upstairs to my room. Let's go. I have to go upstairs. Yeah, let's go. Because yeah. I have to get dressed for the show. In those newly released recordings of the 2015 sting operation with Ombre Gutierrez, you can hear how most of the encounter plays out. After some wooing at the bar, Weinstein tells Ombre he needs to go up to his room to change. She agrees to go with him. And while she's still trying to extract a confession, it's clear she's now uncomfortable. She brings up the day before, when he grabbed her breasts. So, yeah, because I'm not really like that. I need to know more the first. Okay. I understand. Yeah, so... Well, we won't do that. Okay. We'll do other things, but not that, okay? Don't worry. What things? No, nothing, just relaxing things. What? A massage, something. No, I'm, I'm shy. I know, but a massage, something nice. No. <laughs> no, I mean, like, yeah. not, not today, maybe. No. A little bit. Uh, please. <laughs> no, I don't want to. <laughs> All right, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Don't be foolish, he says. There's more back and forth. So I see. And then... Hi, Andy Really from TMZ. How are you doing, sir? Nice to see you. Who is uh, the lady you're in your company with? What are you doing? Whatever. I'm just asking, what are you in your company with? This is actually an undercover cop, pretending to be a TMZ reporter, trying to stop Weinstein from bringing Gutierrez into his room. Andy, what's your last name? That's what you just asked me, my name. Well, we gotta find out your name. You know my name? I know my first name. What's your last name? Let me get a picture. There's no getting anything. Let me get a picture. Let me get anything. One picture. picture. I'll give you space. Andy, I'll give you space. I'll give you space. Close it. I'm gonna call the hotel management now. What's happening? When that intervention fails, Weinstein eventually gets Ambra upstairs, where she refuses to go into his room. And an increasingly belligerent Weinstein tells her never to call him again. I will never do another thing to you five minutes. Don't ruin your friendship with me for five minutes. I know, but it's kind of like, it's too much for me, I can't. Please, you're making When he finally relents, they go back to the bar. The conversation wraps up with his clearest threat. I give you my word, if you don't trust me, then we have no reason to do anything, and you will lose big opportunities. I know that I lose a point Later that day, police brought Weinstein into the precinct for questioning. The story leaked to the press. And for Ambra, the fallout was swift. Weinstein hired a team of private investigators to dig up dirt on her. Claims that she was a prostitute or a shakedown artist, which she denies. Weinstein's lawyers also conveyed those claims about her to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which dropped the effort to charge him. And then the insinuations started showing up in tabloids that had close relationships with Weinstein. Suddenly, Ambra couldn't find work. She slipped into a depression and left the country. We could never put your finger on why. You can't say that, oh, did he really do this? We see, we see how far he's gone to do this to actresses that said no to him. After Rosanna Arquette's encounter with Weinstein in the 90s, she felt her career slowed down too. When we first started talking, right off the bat, you were saying that, you know, I think he wrecked my career. That's what he did to, to Daryl. Daryl Hannah, who starred in the Kill Bill films, which Weinstein produced. She later told me that Weinstein harassed her repeatedly in the 2000s. He showed up at her hotel room. He asked to touch her breasts. When she told him to, quote, fuck off, she said the retaliation was immediate. He actually started saying, oh, she was such a pain in the ass on the set. She was just awful and really saying bad things about her that were not true. That wasn't the truth. That's not how she rolls. People love working with Daryl Hannah, especially crew. Not cool. Directors have actually come out and admitted to some of this. Peter Jackson, who directed the Lord of the Rings trilogy, said he removed actresses Ashley Judd and Mira Sorvino from a casting list after Miramax said they were, quote, a nightmare to work with. Jackson said he had no knowledge of the allegations against Weinstein and now believes the comments about Judd and Sorvino were part of a smear campaign. For Rosanna, she also felt put off by agents and directors. I was then, for sure, on a blacklist. I'm sorry. It, it is amazing so crazy. how, uh, you know, suddenly there were all these women in Hollywood who were crazy when they, when they started standing up about this issue. But you know, therefore, better than anyone that one of the responses that you get when you make this argument that maybe your career suffered as a result of this is... It's hard for actresses anyway. People's careers are up. They're old. Down. She's too old. It's not her fault. Right. What do you say to that? Um, well, I say, fuck off. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many stories. There's so many. It's just so corrupt. And you just go, God, do we even want to be in this business? I mean, it's ridiculous how bad it is. Did you do the meeting? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yep. Immediately after the incident in Weinstein's office in 2004, Lucia Evans struggled to get through the promised meeting with Weinstein's casting director. I just remember the table feeling so big and me just feeling tiny, like this tiny, tiny person at the other end of it, just like a little shadow of myself. She never wound up working with Weinstein. In fact, when she went back to school that fall, she only performed in a couple more roles before giving up theater entirely. She says she just couldn't act, couldn't access parts of herself she used to be able to. You know, after the assault, I was so closed off. I struggled with so many things, you know, I was depressed, I, you know, substance abuse problems, all sorts of you know, eating issues. I actually just saw a video that one of my parents' best friends had made of me and, and my two other friends when I was eight or something, and just playing and acting and performing. And I, I could barely stop crying when I, when I saw that because it was just so real and I just had so much confidence and I just didn't give a shit. You know, it was just, I was just me. I'm trying to get back to that person and I'm finally, I'm starting to, but I mean, it's, it's, 
And he just really took that away from me for so long. I remember just thinking, I wish my parents would would tell me that it was okay that it happened. They were like, how are they going to tell me? They didn't even know what happened. But I kept saying, when I have kids, I'm going to tell them that if this happens to them, it's okay. And to talk to me about it. I guess what's so interesting to me about the dangling of career help that we see over and over again in these stories is he, when he defends himself publicly, talks about this like it's exculpatory. Like the fact that he offered to help people and use that as an enticement means that those people were then consenting in some way, buying into it in some way. But of course, that's not the case. And you were drawn in to the extent that you consented to a business meeting. Exactly. That's a totally reasonable thing. He's a producer and I was an aspiring actress. Say someone, you know, had other ambitions and met up with him, even if it was at a different place in his office and it wasn't consensual, they're not culpable. No one's culpable if it's not consensual. I decided then and there that I did not want to go into entertainment. Because, because of this experience? Be- oh, yeah, because of this experience. After her breakfast with Weinstein, Emily Nestor got caught in a whirlwind of corporate politics at the Weinstein Company. Word traveled. Someone filed an HR report without her knowledge. An executive reached out to apologize and say Weinstein had harassed other employees before. It was all enough that she just went into a different field entirely. I thought, I, I don't want to be in any industry where I don't have options. If one person is angry, then I have no future. It was just a few months later that Emily read the first tabloid headlines about Ombra Gutierrez. And I remember it coming out and watching the press get spun. It first came out, Harvey, you know, groped someone. And then it started to spin and they talked about her Italian background and this, you know, something with all these sex parties. I mean, I watched it spin and thought, that's why I didn't come forward. This is exactly it. This is what he would have done to me. So what broke the pattern? Well, another pattern. All these women decided to fight back, to tell their stories publicly. I am still afraid that uh, he will come after me if he finds out that I'm coming out publicly. And I'm very afraid that the response would be personal and vengeful. That's Emily Nestor in a June 2017 interview she gave for NBC News cameras while I was working on the story there. She decided to talk to me, first anonymously with her face in shadow, and then volunteering to be fully on the record. I said, okay, if it's if it comes down to, to me going on the record, again, if you can do anything else, please do it, but I'm I will go on the record. I said, is it possible to just attach my name to the previously shot interview? Do I have to show my face? And you said, I mean, I can try. You may we may have to reshoot it. And, and I said, okay, if, if we have to, that's fine. NBC executives killed the story as Weinstein besieged them with personal calls and legal threats. The network's president, Noah Oppenheim, and his boss, Andy Lack, have repeatedly claimed that Nestor was never willing to go on the record. NBC executives have been very clear in saying she never volunteered to go on the record. Not only being very clear and lying about that, but also so condescending. It's infuriating to me that Lack and Oppenheim still have their jobs. I do not know how this is possible, that they can behave so abhorrently and so unapologetically abhorrently, not just to make the mistake in the first place, but then to double down on it, try to discredit you, me, any other victim that that wanted to be a part of this piece, and continue to do so. So you're saying that characterization that they've put out, that you did not volunteer to go on the record, is not accurate? Yes, it is not accurate. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little carried away there. Nestor stayed on the record, even after realizing the NBC story had been killed and she became a part of my first New Yorker story on Weinstein. It was really important. Other women were going to continue to get hurt if this story did not run. I couldn't live with myself knowing that I had not done anything to prevent that. I was scared. You know that. Later that same summer, I reached out to Rosanna Arquette through a very secure channel, a Twitter DM to her sister. You got in touch with my sister, and then she called me, she goes, this is a gnarly story. Speaking about this wasn't easy for her either. I mean, there was a point where uh, your fact checker checker people called me and I I got frankly hysterical. I said, I I can't do this. I can't do this. I didn't want to go on record. I was really, really terrified to go on record like all of us at some point were. I remember you saying in that first call, he will find a way to hurt you. He'll find a way to hurt any of us who help with the story. That's what he does. Well, God knows you've certainly found that out. Yes. You were you were terrified. Yeah, I was. Rosanna, like Emily, was motivated by a desire to protect other women. She worried speaking out might have alienated her further from the industry. I didn't have any agent for the last, for a lot of years. But she says she'd do it again. To tell the truth is always powerful. Even though it's painful sometimes, but this is what we have to do. In the final days of my reporting, I got one more tip. An acquaintance said he knew Lucia Evans had a story. He said she was one of the most credible people he knew. I pretty much decided I was going to do it 
during that first conversation because I called my parents right afterwards and told them, and I'd never told them before. One of the things that helped convince Lucia to go on the record was this new pattern that had been set in motion. The women Weinstein had dangled opportunities in front of were finally telling their stories. Some of them had even given me permission to share their names if it would help convince others. I know that this would be a huge help to all these women. Rosanna Arquette just gave her name. Oh my God, are you serious? Oh, that's so amazing. Good for her. Oh, that's incredible. Um, Yeah, so more and more are, are, are joining. Lucia told her story in The New Yorker and then even volunteered to tell it again on the stand when detectives from the NYPD's cold case squad showed up on her doorstep after the story ran. Her allegation was a clear example of assault. It fell within the statute of limitations. Yeah, I was the first one who they they said we can put him in jail. Like, I mean, they, of course, made it seem like they could arrest him immediately. We all know that was not the case. The detectives also warned her that Weinstein's defense team would pour resources into attacking her and trying to get the charge dropped. But they told her the case might hinge on her participation. They always said I was their best chance of winning. I was their, the strongest story I had, you know, whatever, whatever they would tell me over and over and over. They believed me, etc. Lucia said yes. The process was bruising. Lucia and her husband moved in with friends for a time due to security concerns. She had to tell her story over and over again for months. They even made her tour the space where she alleged the assault had happened. In his disgusting office that then I had to go and walk through with a DA again. And in the end, the warnings proved true. Weinstein's lawyers were able to get Lucia's charge dropped. A friend who'd previously corroborated Lucia's version of events changed her story in testimony to law enforcement. Weinstein's team argued that a detective on the case had withheld that information from prosecutors. Weinstein's lawyer later credited the dropping of the charge to the work of a private investigator. You try to do the right thing and tell the truth, and you feel very betrayed and abandoned by the system that you would hope will be designed to protect you. Multiple sources in the DA's office told me they never had any questions about Lucia's credibility. But her charge was now tainted just enough by the process that they felt dropping it would mean an overall greater likelihood of a conviction. It's been confusing and frustrating for Lucia, but she still thinks it was worth it. Coming together with Ambra and Emily and Rosanna to break the story, and even working with law enforcement. I would do it again. There's no, there's no question I would. Even though it was a painful process, I would do it again, and I would hope that others would, because without us doing this, there is no hope for any of these people to get put in jail. So I would just really hope that, as, as horrible as this was for me, that other people can just be strong and know that You know, they have to try. The Catch and Kill podcast is a production of Pineapple Street Studios and me, Ronan Farrow. It's produced by Sophie Bridges, Sharina Ong, Janelle Pfeiffer, and Unjin Lee. Our senior producer is Eric Mennel. Editing by Joel Lovell and Max Linsky. Pineapple's executive producers are Jenna Weiss-Berman and Max Linsky. Production support from Maddie Sprung-Kaiser, Emily Becker, and Barry Finkel. Fact-checking by Sean Lavery. Music in this episode from Blue Dot Sessions, First Calm, and Marmoset. Special thanks this week to Crooked Media. I pulled some strings for studio space. Next week, inside the tense, sleep-deprived, and sometimes sweaty race to break these stories at The New Yorker. That building turns off the air circulation system at a certain point in the evening. So we were not only in a sort of pressure cooker to get the story out, but we were in a a hot house, more or less. I I think one early draft of the book had a a description of our kind of pit stains that ultimately seemed too gross and ungracious to keep in. (laughs) Too graphic, too graphic. This is all based on reporting I did for my book, Catch and Kill, available where you buy your books and as an audiobook. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. We know this week's episode was heavy. If you'd like to talk to someone confidentially about an experience of sexual violence, you can call the RAIN hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673. You can also go to online.rainn.org for support via confidential chat.